Well, good day, people. <laughs> so it's been a while. It's kind of fun. Um, been in a bit of an exchange on Facebook with Matt, thou art that, about a guy, uh, I think his name is Neil Thies, or Thies. He doesn't really introduce himself in this Vimeo uh, video that Matt had shared on his Facebook uh, on his page, and it was called Complexity Theory and Panpsychism. And I, I I disagreed with some of the some of the claims, and we got into an exchange. And I thought I would just take some of this here onto YouTube. So, as I I've said in so many other videos, I'm I'm more of an advocate for an emergentist position. I think th there's nothing that's gained by the panpsychist, and you know Matt has been calling it pan experientialist, which I was sort of a, a different term there, sort of added into it. But so if you haven't seen the video, you need to see it. I'm gonna, you know, I'll put a link down, and you can watch the video. It's about 22, 23 minutes or so. It's a little over 20 minutes, and then you can decide, you know, what you think. You know, first off, I think that much of what he does in the video, at least the first 10 minutes, is just great. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any problem with any of those claims with regard to life. That is, is life itself sentient? Are there forms of sentience that go all the way down to things like bacteria and even biomolecules? Sure, I guess I would even grant that, that there's going to be some sort of goal-directed information processing and you know his discussion about paramecium and when it you know flattens against the wall to be able to you know kind of introduce what a, a nutrient gradient for itself in you know magnesium or you know there, there are different kinds of ions that allow it to gather quotes information in a way that is adaptive and takes advantage of some of the, the variability there and it, it you know it's able to grow and thrive. I don't think any of that's a problem. When you try to move from there as he does basically about the 11 minute mark and then about again at the 17 minute mark, he goes from cells, which I think are you know clear cases of life, to biomolecules, which again, it's ambiguous, I'd grant. As soon as you get to atoms and the subatomic and the quantum and you're going to start to talk about string theory, where's the low-level randomness, Matt? You know, if you're going to say that there's low-level randomness and the kind of mid-range complexities, you know, when he's given all the ant colony stuff, notice how he suggests that it's when there are lots of different ants, all these new properties come up, but as you diminish the number of ants, you know, as you go from, you know, lower than 25, they start to no longer perform certain rituals, and at three, you know, they're basically doing nothing. Where would you ever have something like the comparative case of that at the subatomic level? See, it's really strange. I mean, he's giving some strange analogies. You know, when he's talking about the atoms sensing their environment through the electron shell that they occupy due to the, quotes randomness there, is that low-level randomness? See, it's, it would seem to me that in order to claim that something is random or not random, you already have to have something like an assessable probability field. But I don't think that's what we have. We don't have anything like that at the at the string theory level. I mean, it's a bunch of highly speculative mathematics. It's it's not in any way like those emergent properties that we do see in things like ant colonies. Now, ant colonies are clearly an emergent. So to try to draw direct parallels and say, well, things that are emergent, which have certain properties and that, that in their complexity at higher levels of emergence, you know, carry even wider ranges of, of complexity. Then you say, well, how, where's the parallel to that down at these different levels when you're doing comparative level analysis, which he's, you know, he's suggesting that he's doing. Even, you know, the question of uh, about, uh, we'll say you know, it's about 12 minutes and 30 seconds in, he basically says that the universe is a self-organizing complex system top to bottom. Now, 
there are senses in which I could say, or I think many people say, yeah, okay, it's self-organizing. But to claim that the sentience that we have, that is, those who are trying to understand how pervasive sentience is, to claim that some subspecies of that is located all the way down, I, I, I don't know what is to be, you know, what's really to be gained by it. First, there's all kinds of problems with it, because it would seem to me, again, that information is, it's the way variety gets coded according to organismal goal-seeking. And when you have life, you actually do have something like goals and goal-seeking, and that goal-seeking turns the variety into a coded variety that is information. I don't see evidence for that in the electron shell. I mean, if a, if a boulder rolls down a hill and it collects various particles along the way and it grows a little bit as it's, you know, a agglutinating, or it's, it's, it has an agglutinative process of, you know, g gathering things as it's rolling along, it, to say that it has a memory and somehow that's a record of, of what it's done you know, that's some person always introducing a frame of reference to what had gone earlier, but at the stage where it's at, it's always just wherever it is, and it it's working by, uh, you know, forms of, you know, contiguity and continuity and contact and, and local, you know, I guess local ways. Now, if people try to introduce all this spookiness and non-locality and problems with quantum theory. I don't know how any of that relates to these issues that we're talking about when we talk about the difference in sizes of ant colonies or when we talk about the difference between a small village and a society or a major city. You know, it, it seems like some of the kinds of emergent properties that people are interested in when they're asking questions about emergence and complexity theory, they... They want to stress the importance of the difference rather than what's common across it all. Uh, now, I think that the real beef that I have with peace, you know, if I would say, it's that we're not really sure what it is he's claiming. Because, you know, so, okay, at points he wants to say, look, the thermostat and the air conditioner, uh, the, there's not enough randomness in there. There's no randomness. It's too set. It's not adaptive. And they're not alive. And so he's saying there, there's not sentience there. But well, wait a second, they're made of those subatomic particles, so isn't there something like a sentience still inside them? Well, I think he would say the atoms and the molecules, they're not alive, but they're sentient, but they organize themselves into the kind of complexity that then is non-adaptive, that we can just create. See, I, there seems to be levels of complexity confusions going on. Now, he, I'll force the issue even more. I mean, someone might claim that it's kind of a nugatory claim. You know, it's, it's, it washes into this isn't really what anyone wanted to know about. That is, the, those who have the kind of sentience that we have, which is that kind of sentience that wants to know to what extent is sentient pervasive or not, is it emergent, you know, wh where exactly is sentience coming from, is it solely and exclusively uh, neurophysiological, does it need larger environment, I mean, are magnetic fields, are gravitational fields an essential component of nervous systems, are, are nervous systems even involved, I mean, people can raise all kinds of questions about where this particular consciousness that we're experiencing is coming from, but then when they raise that larger question to simply say, well, yeah, there's family resemblances all the way down, well, then it's a land of diminishing returns as everything in the category just starts to look identical to each other. You know, it's not really what people want to know about. Uh, you know, if somebody says, they go into a grocery store and say, you know, do you have any fruits or vegetables? And the person says, well, you know, you don't, you don't need fruits or vegetables. You know, everything is food. And they say, well, no, not everything is food. You know, I want some fruits or vegetables. And they say, well, yeah, you know, the, 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 you know, the particle board and the, the dirt, the dirt is food. And you're like, well, no, it's not food. And they're like, well, yeah, it's made of energy. And energy is all really, you know, food is basically energy. I mean, if, you, if people try to trace things down through abstract terms, it just becomes meaningless. And that's sort of what's being said about sentience. I mean, when sentience starts to include things like, you know, atoms 
registering their their shell, you know, the electron shell in, in, you know, in an atom. That that seems very different than something like an appetite, a need for sleep. That seems something very different than the the kind of complexities that I think people want to ask about when they're asking about what we mean by human sentience. I think when we ask about human sentience, there's a whole bunch of levels. I mean, not only is it to begin with things like what does this mean for ethics and morality? I mean, are there realms of ethics and morality in the subatomic or at the level of DNA? Now, it's interesting. When he talks about the DNA um, be behaving like a sentience thing and talking about it being adaptive, it's adaptive only in reference to that larger system that it's playing out in. So he says, yeah, it's adaptive because somehow it's taking the what would be a mutation and moving it to a place where it's not going to have that uh, likely of a, a negative impact. He says, you know, it's going to minimize the possibility of cancer or something. He's making it seem like it's registering in a sophisticated way something that potentially is part of a larger hierarchy. It's sort of like he's given it like the ant kind of colony comparison but then how does that fit with all of the rest of that stuff? See, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. You know, other than through metaphorical slippage, people who don't pay attention to the metaphors that they're using in their language could easily conclude that, oh yeah, you know, electrons are feeding on neighbors and they're storing up information and using it to adapt to their environment. I don't think so. It, are there growth of systems at those levels? See, when you start to do the leveled stuff, it's interesting, and you can say we, we can compare levels, but at a certain point, there aren't new emergent properties on that level in the way that here at the level of cellular biological life, we do have new emergent forms. Right. I mean, uh, I mean, not only in terms of reptiles, birds, mammals, I mean, but the, the, the whole range You have plants. Uh, it seems like each one of those. Yeah, no, no problem giving a kind of sentience there. It has to be adaptive to its environment. What exactly is an environment adapting to? You say it's adapting to itself. Well, OK, is adaption there just a metaphor? It's. It's, um, what, it's registering itself. It's an amazing, delicate balance of forces, and it's, it's infinitely complex. You know, I, I don't know that any of that, though, means that it has to have sentience. But let's go back to the, the, the so what stuff. You know, I think this is why it's not satisfactory. It's because not only are people concerned about things like ethics and morality and how those relate to sentience, but they're concerned about, like, when I receive an anesthetic for a tooth uh, surgery, if I'm, if I'm going to get knocked out, they're, they're able to localize the anesthetic. So they just take out my consciousness, but my, you know, my rest of my respiratory system continues to function, or they're, they're able to, you know, manipulate certain parts of what we mean by consciousness. So when I go out of consciousness, when I lose my experience of sentience, to say, well, no, you didn't really because your body is still sentient. Well, it, okay, now it is, but that's not what I meant by sentience. Because otherwise, then what would it mean to put me under? You know, there's a me, an emergent me who gets put under, right? Now you could say, well, that's, and we could get into all the, the physiology there. Does it just have to do with recall? Does it have to do with actually experience what's being put under? Well, then it raises the question of, you know, is there a conscious? Is there an unconscious? You know, is there a collective unconscious? Is there a subconscious? When you start to get to all these kinds of things, well, where does that fit into the theory of the subatomic particle and the, you know, the string? You know, to, to say that the, the, the string has an unconscious, too? We say, no, well, it's different. Well, at the point where it's so different, then the family resemblance is so different, then why still call it more of the same, right? Think of just the way that, like, in developmental psychology, you know, people are really concerned with that, you know, the whole spectrum of, of um, disabilities, you know, related to Os uh, Osberger's and autism, 
you know, if, if someone fails to pass the false belief test, you know, someone can't pass a, a salient and test, and they're they're unable to, you know, prove that you know they're, they're registering, you know, their own false beliefs or that other people have false beliefs. They're unable to give subjective status to their own beliefs. They sort of don't understand that there are other minds. I think there is a fear there that that's a very different kind of sentience. And people, again, they're, they're concerned over it. Now, it's not that people are going to say that that's not, it's not a kind of consciousness. But when people are interested in the theory of consciousness, that is, what, what do we mean by consciousness? I think they're largely, like when they ask, is there life on alien planets, they often want to say, well, is it intelligent life? And then the whole notion of is it intelligent life, it kind of makes it a, a moot point, right? In some way, you couldn't go anywhere where there isn't intelligence. I mean, so it, it just starts to wash basic orientations that people have. And so, what can I say? I personally don't have that much of a pony in this in this race. I, I believe that there is no need for a pan-psychist or a pan-experientialist position. One can have a fully emergentist position. You simply claim that the cosmos is a delicate balance of an am amazing, you know, uh, intricate, intricate uh, uh, set of relations and it's you know, there's an orderliness that naturally precipitates forms of complexity that they emerge and each new level of emergence then holds a whole new set of probability fields. And from within those probability fields, that's when you can start to determine what we mean by random or not random or low level of randomness or too much randomness in order to have those other emergent properties that we're going to call adaptive. But if if you try to begin with that issue at the, the subatomic particle, which people right now are, you know, there's haggle over what it is, you know, it, it, I mean, there's, there's just count, countless haggles over that. And I, I'm, I'm, I would be very skeptical if someone would say that, yeah, okay, A, we did find it and it's low level probability and it's adaptive in the same way that we're talking about life and it has goals and it's trying to stay alive or it's whatever. But even there, the question of what is the worth of the family resemblance and the claim that it's consciousness or that it's sentience. I mean, at the end of the video, the guy basically says consciousness causes the cosmos. It's the source of the cosmos. And then he says, well, it's sentience. And then he, he's, he's bobbling back and forth between the word consciousness and sentience as if they're, they're synonymous terms. And I, I think... You know, the lack of distinctions there. I think one last thing about it, and, you know, he's, just, he's obviously a very smart guy. You know, I'm not trying to be, to be, you know, contentious. I think, though, that the use of all the video in the backdrop helps distract you. You know, it, it, me anyways, I kept having to stop and actually listen to the actual words he's using. If you would read a transcript of what he's saying, I don't think it'd be very persuasive. You notice inconsistencies and slippage in the words and his argument about a river, you know, the river, and then suddenly the river's talking about the DNA. He's, he's, he's bobbling all around places. But because we're distracted by the images in the background, uh, it's, it's sort of maybe not as apparent. At any rate, uh, so those would be some responses, Matt. I'd love to hear what you have to say about any of that. I know it wasn't very systematic, but uh, hope all is well with you. Okay, take care. Bye.